Okay, greetings, brothers and sisters. So, Alex Jones is crying <laughs> um, about losing InfoWars, and I'll get into that in a bit. I got MSNBC gloating on that. But I was already going to drop a voiceover about the nature of the way the system takes away your time steals your time and energy to keep you down and I want to talk about that and you know I go through these other things first because they're all tied together and so the first one the first part of this is this um, this is Celine Dion and I covered this in my last video but there's this one part that really bugged me I talked about it pretty extensively but I have more to add here and so this is her talking about being a ghoul. You know, she has stiff person syndrome. I miss it so much. So this movement right here where she throws the ball between her legs to her son. And I talked about how he's all dressed up in this thing, right? And this isn't a real catch, right? They're, this isn't benefiting him. Like the father-son catch, you know, of course his dad's dead and they're Canadian. But he obviously plays baseball. Maybe she has a place here probably in Vegas. I think she lives in Vegas, so he's probably growing up in America and playing baseball. And, you know, he doesn't have a dad. So she's out there doing this here, you know, throwing the ball between her legs, right? And that's not a catch, right? Because when you're in a situation where you're having a catch with your son, it's about him, right? You throw grounders, you throw pop flies, right? So he's get used to fielding right if he plays in the infield you're you're getting him used to picking up grounders you throw grounders or you, you you hit the ball to him and you know this is you helping him develop the skills he needs to play baseball right and so it's all about him and you know the kid and the, the dad having this connection but also when I worked in treatment centers kids would get one in one time and with the staff and you'd often have a catch with for you know, a, a baseball, you shoot, shoot baskets or you would um, throw a frisbee. And whenever you're having a catch, it's a way to connect with people. You're throwing something to them, it's cooperative, and it you know forms a bonding experience. And it gives a chance for the adult to you know make the kid feel like they're noticed and all these things, right? And none of those things are going on here because of this selfish boop C word. <laughs> is doing this as a photo opportunity and instead of making it about him right she does something that doesn't belong in catch where she throws the ball between her legs here right let me mute it throws the ball between her legs here and you know that's about her that's about her showing off like she does with everything else and then dismissing the kid because she used him as a prop and that's everything that's wrong with celebrities in hollywood where they become so narcissistic, their kids are just extensions of themselves, right? And she's, you know, doing this as a way to, like, oh, look how fancy I am. They're only 10 feet away. This isn't a catch. This is not benefiting him. You're using him as a prop, and that's your kid. So, like, this is how, you know, they, they feast on the, the crowd and, you know, having public perception and public approval, like, is so prevalent today on today's social media. And it's just disgusting, right? It's failing as an adult in every possible way. So my wife and I watched the two seasons of The Traitors in England, um, which was much more enjoyable than the American version. They have uh, the same exact show, except they don't use... In America, they make it even bigger and over the top. The same activities, right? The same kind of challenges, the same whatever. And I'll get into the show in a moment. But in America, they used reality TV stars. And many of them were desperate hives, housewives. Some of them are former survivor type people. But they're, um, it's not great at all, right? It's pretty horrible um, because the people are horrible. And in England, they just use average people. And some of them are, you know, have social media presence. They all probably have some social media. Some of them were, you know, one of them was allegedly a comedian, another one was. Um, a uh, like a, a, magi a, a magician and things like this but for the most part this is the American version this guy is just over the top but what was great about the English version I'm going to switch over to a voiceover now 
what was great about the um the uh the english version was the men crying like there's other things that are good about it but in season one we watched season two first which was probably the best season of the traders and what's great about the show is it shows you how you're screwed because it's based in a psychological game from some russian guy to want to show how you're abused by the system by a lack of information right where there's a game called the wolves that he invented where there are these wolves and then there's villagers and the wolves are uh you know they're given this position in secret and the wolves usually it's two or three people you know depending on the size of the group that you have right and the traders it's usually three there's usually about three traders you know two to three traders and the traders meet secretly and murder everybody at night you know this is i mean it would be a shorter game if you're doing it you know they'd they'd meet every once in a while and in the tv show the traders you know they meet and then they have activities to put money into the pot because somebody's going to get the money at the end and the way it works is that the faithful if there's three faithful left or one faithful left at the end of the you know, this can't be there's got to be at least two they split the money and if the um if the if there's one trader the trader gets all the money or if there's two traders they split it right and so there's a couple of great things about it so the, the reason that it's so much so uh, relevant is that the traders have access to information they're murdering people and they're basically sending you know sort of shock and you know by the people that they take out in the game and as these people live together and they bond together they're watching each other and scrutinizing each other to see if they're traitors or not and there's this level of paranoia and people just misreading people and the traitors often are the most likable people the ones that succeed and people never suspect them because you know they forget that they're playing a game and anybody could be the traitor and they start being prejudicial based in their preferences and they'll never vote for certain people there are people that are obviously the traitors as the game plays out and evidence comes out because in the beginning they don't know right and they rig the game so that they make more traitors so there's always some traitors right so you have to vote out faithful you know the faithful banish somebody every night hoping that they get a traitor but in reality they have to take their numbers down because there's only going to be four people in the final vote so they have to whittle 22 people down to four whether they're traitors or faithful or whatever right and people who successfully playing the game kind of realize that but there are people that they bond so much there's a woman in the you know in one of the seasons that's so like motherly no one's even suspecting that she's possibly a traitor and would never vote for her, right they just they can't even conceive of voting her out as a traitor they can't conceive of her being one and it's like great in that way but what inevitably happens is the traitors don't want to split the money plus you know in the end vote if they suspect there's a traitor, then they can keep on voting people out to try to get rid of them. And so the traitors have to turn on each other. The traitors have to take one other traitor with them and get that traitor banished at the end. And so that person says they're a traitor so that they think they got all the traitors and then the traitor can take the money. And the people who are with the traitor at the end love the traitor and feel completely betrayed <laughs> so the show is really great that way but in season one in the english show the men cry every one of them like weep pathetically so i mean from the beginning to the end they're always freaking crying and it's hilarious like there's no masculinity and it's something you know i mean just in terms of the entertainment value if you like to see men weep over a, a game like if you imagine playing a game of monopoly and crying right <laughs> I am, i'm not a traitor i'm a faithful i'm 100 percent faithful i mean it's just bad it's it's hilariously bad but anyways this is also going to tie into my voiceover let's go to the alex jones thing though here okay i think this person's name is alex wagner yeah right here alex wagner alex wagner tonight is the name of the show uh she's one of the most anti-truther people uh, and she's a big one on msnbc they have a couple big ones on cnn but here she sets in on the Schill and 
you know, the COINTEL Pro operative, Alex P. Jones. So it has been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad week for conspiracy theorists. Oh, my God, Alex. What? Tell me about it. Normally, there would be no good reason to show you a clip of the reality distortionist Alex Jones. But this... You guys show clips all the time. ...was really something. I'm like literally here like watching a family member die, like 30 years on air, 27 years as operation, 15 years in this building. And I'm literally, when I know I leave tonight, they're going to shut us down. Maybe it's tomorrow, the next day. I just want people to know I love you. I believe in you. I believe in humanity. I believe in my grandparents. I believe in my parents. I believe in humanity. And I just want to stop these people. This is when he fake cries. It's kind of hilarious. That's an entertaining persona alex jones has his you know let me show my let me show my memes here you know what it's like to go to sleep every night knowing you work for a bunch of psychotic killers and you bastards are probably gonna end up killing me one day you know what it's like knowing you've ruined my life you know what it's like you sons of bitches i'm tired of your crap you know what it's like to go to sleep every day knowing you work for a bunch of psychotic killers that are probably gonna kill you one day you bastards you ruined my life i want to quit I want my 401k. Let me get out of this contract. A thousand people that run the world, according to the Kissinger Group's own book, Superclass, put out 15 years ago, and I believe it's accurate. And the one guy that wrote it, Rothkop, the head of the Kissinger Group, tried to recruit me to go meet with them in New York and Henry Kissinger. Okay, so I'm explaining how real this is, okay? They tried to recruit me. They did it in front of my producer, so it's the only time I can talk about it because the other meetings were off record with other globalists. I have off record meetings with these people, okay? You know, I have to probably say that I have major Masonic roots. Uh, a lot of my family, because uh, Texas was pretty much Masonic through and through, was Masonic, high level Masonic. And they were very, very good people. George Washington was a Mason. And all it is is a university study of religions, of philosophy, and of building, and of mathematics, and of agrarian systems. And so what you see as Masons today is just those schools going on. And there have been hundreds of different variants and groups and Rosicrucian orders within the Masons and the Illuminati uh founded in germany was a counter illuminati to the real illuminati and and yes undoubtedly my family on both sides on the mayflower hardcore protestants you could say rosicrucians this country was founded by real rosicrucians not the rosicrucians you see out there today and so undoubtedly um if you want to say it i mean i would say i come out of a classical enlightenment family of what you would call real illuminati uh real enlightenment and i'll just say it here and everybody asks me who i am i'll tell you there's no secret society there's no secret messages there's no secret handshakes there's freedom there's jesus christ this is a human this is what we look like this is what we act like this is what everybody was like before us this is what i am i'm a throwback i'm here I've got the fire of human liberty. I'm setting fires everywhere. This is a shill. This is what we look like. This is what we act like. This is how you make $165 million. I'm Cointel Pro. I work for the CIA. I'm cutting you out of your money. I'm cutting you out of your money everywhere. We're at war. I've declared bankruptcy. I'm broke. I need your help right now. My body's full of cholesterol. And there's a strange growth on my scrotum. There's only one way to fight this madness, to win this war. You need to buy my products. And you need to do it now, before my head explodes. My blood pressure is too high. I'm on the verge of being thrown out by Illuminati. And they've canceled my gym membership. And I need your money and your support now. I just made a stinky. Roger. Gotta be stopped. We gotta stop him. So, at the end of the day, we're gonna beat these people. <laughs> <laughs> It's like this on um, season one of England of the Traitors, constant crime. I'm not trying to be dramatic here, but it's been a hard fight. That was Alex Jones. She's gloating. You know, she's happy. He's 
Jones, one of the country's biggest conspiracy theorists, crying, at least we think it was crying, on his show last weekend about the fact that his program InfoWars might finally be coming to an end. For decades, Jones and InfoWars have pushed insane conspiracy theories. Insane ones. Like 9-11 was an inside job and the U.S. government controls the weather. Okay, so let's talk about this being insane, right? Because the big event 2001, again, I'm not going to speak about it here because of YouTube sucking, but, you know, in terms of why is it insane? Why is it insane? Well, let's go with the weather one first. If a government can control the weather, do you think they would control the weather, right? People have wanted to control weather forever. Weather is one of the biggest threats to humanity in our daily lives. Let me switch over to a voice over here. You know, we control the weather every day. We control the weather in our house and in our cars, right? Do you want to give up your air conditioning and your heat? That's controlling the weather. That's climate control. You're controlling the climate in your house, in your car, where you can do that. We want to control everything. We want to make our lives easier. We want to, I mean, we have insurance against any sort of catastrophe. You know, if there's a hurricane and these types of things, right? And there was a, a film I watched years ago. Um, it was about a big baseball game, the World Series. I think it was the Yankees. And maybe their pitcher was hurt. They wanted to wait a day so the pitcher could get more rest or something. And so the owner seeded clouds. This is a black and white movie, like an old 1930s, 40s movie, 50s, whatever it was. And he's seeding the clouds, which was a way to make it rain. And rainfall is a big deal, right? People with droughts, do you think they would control the weather if they could get it to uh, rain where there's going to be potential forest fire destroying uh, valuable forests and national parks and things and people's homes. You think they would control the weather and make it rain? Okay, so they would control the weather, right? They could want to control everything. And so we know that happens, right? We know there's false flag attacks to make wars happen. This has happened throughout history where a, a, a superior army wants to create you know, a situation where a weaker country who would never provoke them into war provokes them into war. It happened in The Princess Bride where the prince was going to uh, kill his wife, the Princess Bride, and blame it on Gilder so they could go make an excuse to attack Gilder, invade, and take their land. Like that's a, a, you know just from that movie. So it's believable, right? It's not crazy that these things could be a conspiracy because you know we would control the weather if we could i don't know if we can or not you know there's lots of evidence out there that i used to cover this a little bit but if we can we will right we want to control everything and so don't make it sound like it's crazy because it's not crazy right you know it's not crazy that this you know people would do that because people do stuff like that all the time like stop you know making it sound like it's insane to believe such things because humans will do crazy stuff and have done crazy stuff and your only excuse is that these people are trustworthy and the government and the media are not trustworthy people lie all the time people in power lie even more they lie to people all the time they keep secrets they conspire it happens there's a word for a conspiracy conspire it's a real word because people do it. It's a behavior that people do. People conspire. And so to pretend that it's like crazy, it's not crazy. Like it might not be true, but it's not crazy to believe it because it could be true. Because people will do such things, right? <laughs> you know, people um, say, no, American government would never do that or the media would, would expose it. No, we know that doesn't happen. If they've kept secrets, the nuclear program, atomic the atomic bomb you know there's thousands of people that knew about that project and they still kept it a secret until they developed it no one even knew that these things exist until they dropped them right they were just like a rumor like they nobody knew like you know this was something where the average american person didn't know that they were developing atomic weapons and they did it without the consent of the american people and you know now what's the problem right 
Like, look at what's the potential for nuclear war that everyone's waiting with unbated breath. And so don't pretend these things are crazy because people do crazy stuff. People do evil stuff, right? But perhaps Jones's most pernicious and disturbing conspiracy was his claim that the Sandy Hook massacre, a school shooting that killed 20 first graders and six adult teachers and school staff members, that Sandy Hook was staged. Okay, the big event, 2001, it was 3,000 people died, and the, the idea that it was the government, that's more disturbing, right? Um, but this is the one that they're focused on because of the lawsuit. Sandy Hook, it's got inside job written all over it. Sandy Hook is a synthetic, completely fake, with actors, in my view, manufactured. All I know is the official story of Sandy Hook has more holes in it than Swiss cheese. Alex Jones pushed lies like these about Sandy Hook for years. For years he pushed these lies. Which resulted in his followers harassing and tormenting the families of Sandy Hook victims. So those families sued Alex Jones for defamation and they won. Jones was ordered to pay those families nearly $1.5 billion. Okay, so as a journalist, you don't think that's excessive, right? Now, Alex Jones might be a piece of boop. And, you know, according to these people, they believe they're so much better or whatever, they're shills or whatever it is, right? But, you know, he is doing things that other people do in terms of giving opinions about things that have happened out in the world. And she might not like him, but, you know, the guy um, is kind of, he's got journalistic credentials, right? And he's, you know, considered a, a bottom feeder. But his saying the things that he said, his words are worth $1.4 billion? The average wrongful death settlement can vary significantly and can range from 500000 to over a million. So if you think the worst thing you can do is kill a person, you can say torture might be worse, but, you know, killing a person is considered probably the worst thing. And so 500 to a million dollars. Corporations that have cause people to get cancer and cause them physical damage. And those things are worse than any words that you would say, right? Anything that you might infer. And so these kids that, you know, they're saying died in these events were um, killed by whatever person, right? This, this guy who suffered psychological, whatever it was. The parents didn't sue that guy, right? And you can say, well, that guy didn't have as much, uh, didn't serve, sue that guy's family, or whatever it is, or the psychologist at Yale that treated him, or all these things, or the gun manufacturer, or any number of things they could claim um, contributed to their kids being killed, right? And so they were responsible in some way. You could make a case that these various entities were responsible. The kid was on psychological medication, for example, so... Uh, pharmaceuticals. I mean, if that was, you know, a factor, which certainly is could be a factor, it seems to be a factor in these type of things, you know, for whatever is going on with the official story, whatever it might be. I'm just saying, like, in terms of the official story, they could have sued and would have only won a million dollars for family, right? Now, Alex Jones is a multimillionaire, but his net worth was probably, you know, they said he was making like $150 million a year or something like this. He wasn't a billionaire, right? And this is excessive. The Trump settlement was excessive. The Rudy Giuliani settlement was excessive. And as a reporter, she should say this is a success, is excessive, right? Because he just, he was sued for words that he said, right? <laughs> Generalized words. You know, he's a shell and the whole thing's controlled. And why wouldn't Alex Jones appeal this? Why wouldn't any you know, body of um, any, uh, you know, court in the land take a look at this, the higher courts, the Supreme Court, and say, yeah, uh, $1.4 million is excessive. You know, it should be like $100,000 per person or something, or less, right? I mean, if you know, even if, like, Alex Jones didn't present any sort of case. He heard his, um, he heard his evidence. They sent his emails over to the Prosecutors, his defense accidentally sent his personal emails over, ones that they claimed they didn't have, and it destroyed his case. 
you know, in, in the previous cases, he said he was a performance artist. And so why didn't he go with that, right? Why didn't he go with, oh, I was just being, you know, whatever it was, as a defense, right? Because that would be less if he's, you know, pretending to be a journalist. Because in his divorce case, he said, his lawyer said he was a performance artist, which everyone can see he is, right? That he's not a real journalist. And so this whole thing is ridiculous, right? You get it. There's no way that this should be $1.4 billion. And this reporter should say so, that that's excessive. Excessive by, you know, most of it, like almost all of it, 99% of it. It should be probably under a million dollars, the whole settlement, right? <laughs> and so the whole thing is ridiculous. So let me add this. Alex Jones has, like, press credentials, right? And whether you want to say that he's a conspiracy theorist for this, you know, for these people, he's still in the media. And the media has, just like any other, you know, sort of uh, any other profession, there's a connection. And she, Alex Jones is not MSNBC's competitor, right? Alex Jones isn't viewed. Fox isn't is an MSNBC's competitor. CNN is, right? CNN and MSNBC are going after the same demographic of liberal viewers. Fox News and Alex Jones and Donald Trump are their subject matter, right? Like I'm talking about mainstream media here. The mainstream media isn't my enemy. To whatever extent, media, mainstream media, CNN and MSNBC pushing for the deplatforming and the demonetization of videos. Yeah, that's, I mean, they're, you know, sucky that way. But we're not the same. Like we're not like, you know, in some sort of a battle, right? I, I use these clips all the time from MSNBC and CNN to cover my material here, right? And so Alex Jones is their subject. And so they might claim they hate so-called conspiracy theorists, truthers, but, you know, we're not doing anything. Like, we're not, we don't have any power. We, you know, like it's, like the way they go after Trump is a little different because Trump, you know, allegedly has some power. But Alex Jones is, you know, a fringe person and really has no effect. We have no effect other than we're taking away people from there, watching mainstream media. And there's, the, you know, the overall truth community, sure, the movement that's there is certainly hurting mainstream media. But that battle's already been lost. Like, it's already, you know, happened. The Internet has hurt mainstream media. It's always going to be, if it isn't truthers, it's going to be something else. Because people aren't going to go back and watch the news no matter what. They'd rather, they'd rather watch crap on tip, TikTok and all these things. They're going to get their information from other sources. That's, that sh that uh, ship has already sailed. But her competition is CNN. You know, CNN and MSNBC are in competition for the same audience. And so, like, them to be like, you know, her to be like this about Alex Jones is, it's kind of silly, right? And the ruling is ridiculous. Like, at some point, you got to say, I mean, they don't have to because they don't. But, you know, it just becomes like a joke. Like, if he got, it was, you know, it was a reasonable ruling, then it would be just whatever. But uh, over a billion dollars for a guy who doesn't have close to that, it's it's just insane. For words, right? <laughs> for words, you know, it's not a, it's not a real thing. And, and regardless of what they're claiming people did, like his viewers harassing the people, like he didn't say to go do that, right? So he's not, they're not suing the people who are harassing them. I mean, they're saying that his words cause them to be harassed. Okay, so did you, did you sue the harassers? Well, the harassers are worse than the guy who instigated it, right? The people who are harassing them. And the harassment wouldn't have been that bad. I mean, if it's not even criminal, you know, harassment. I mean, harassment happens every day on the Internet. I get harassed. Anybody who's out there gets harassed, right? We're all getting harassed. And, you know, you, the lawsuit for that, I mean, what's the... You know the verdict of harassment like somehow his words are worse than the harassment which is you know definitely seen as the worst of, of the things right and damages but in 2022 alex jones declared bankruptcy effectively guarding his money from the sandy hook families until tonight tonight sandy hook families accepted a proposal from alex jones to liquidate all of jones's personal assets this court-supervised liquidation will... Okay, so then why would he do that? If he declared bankruptcy, 
and he was protecting his personal assets from the families, why would he go offer them all of what he had? The court supervised liquidation w will allow the families to benefit from immediate asset sales while keeping the claims on Jones' assets alive in the event he accrues wealth in the future. She's going to say this here. Allow the families to benefit from the immediate sale of Jones's assets while keeping their claim alive in the event that Jones accrues more wealth in the future. So like he's like, why would he do this? I mean, what would motivate him to give them everything he has now, liquidate everything he has, lose his business, his job that, you know, is his passion, whatever it is. I mean, he's a shell, but whatever. Like he, this is his number one thing. And they're going to take down Infowars. And if he gets more, they can still take, the, like if he said, all right, you can take this or leave it. I'll give you everything now, but if I earn anything in the future, I get to keep that. But, the, you know, that would be the deal, right? That would be the deal. Okay, I'll give you what I have available. I'll liquidate everything, sell it. You guys can have that. But then, it, you know, but no, like, you know, we want the $1.4 billion. So, like, he might as well just be homeless from now on. And so, you know, that's a ridiculous deal for him to do, right? When, why not appeal any of these things and the, the amount and just all of it? Like, he didn't present any kind of a legal case. And then when he... You know, he just destroyed his, I mean, he just tor torpedoed the whole thing in typical Alex Jones fashion. Like, the whole thing seems like a setup and, like, fake. But, but you know, the whole, it was just ridiculous, right? And as reporters, you should say this is ridiculous for him to do this. And all of this means it could finally be the end for InfoWars. <laughs> So Alex Jones is being held to account, literally, his bank account. Reality has really set in this week, and not just for Alex Jones. This is the epic... I'm going to go back to... Um, I'm going back to... Um, I'll see if I can find that whole thing, because it's funny. ...times. It is a news outlet that started decades ago as an anti-Chinese Communist Party leaflet for the Falun Gong, the fringe religious group. You might know the Falun Gong because of the billboard advertisements for their performance group Shen Yun, a show that travels the country explaining their version of pre-communist Chinese history through song and dance. But at some point in the past 10 years, the Epic Times became less about Chinese sociocultural views and more about just plain old conspiracy theories. Plain old conspiracy theories. The Epic again, Times I don't, you know, I don't consider these things real. You know, I mean, it's Alex Jones is a shill. Epoch Times, uh, people send me stuff from it. I'm not, you know. But again, right? Times pushed anti-vax content, claiming anti-vax content. Vaccines caused widespread injury and death. It pushed seriously niche content, like this documentary revealing a secret world government plot to call the population and force survivors to eat bugs. But for years now, the Epic Times has claimed content like that has been wildly successful. They put up billboards across the country declaring the Epic Times as the number one trusted news. Go boom. In 2021, the Epic Times claimed they had grown the site's revenue by 685% in two years. It all seemed pretty fantastical. Because it was. According to an indictment unsealed this week in the Southern District of New York, the site's content was not the moneymaker here. Not the bug, not the bug plot. Prosecutors allege the real increase in revenue was coming from a massive money laundering scheme. Boom. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, like the whole thing. But, like, this is, you know, again, they're going after anybody who isn't with the official story. Like, this is the next level of doing that. I've been documenting what YouTube's doing to all of us, and not just people who are truthers, but anybody who's producing opinionated type of... Um, Material, they're trying to get rid of that, right? It's a problem that they had when the internet first came about, and now they're having it, you know, with the with all of it, right? But um, they're just doing this across the board, and it doesn't matter. Like they've already won. I mean, they've won in their ability to keep the country and the world going until it collapses from their, you know, mismanagement, which is, you know, it's happening one way or another. But they don't want you to know about it, right? They don't want any other opinion because the system is that fragile. And they're worried that, you know, this could cause the, 
destruction of the system. Okay, so in the week of uh, Wagner's debut last Tuesday, this is an article here. Um, in the week, well, Wagner's new MSNBC show saw a double-digit ratings drop in the first week. In the week of Wagner's debut last Tuesday, MSNBC total viewership for the hour dropped 15 from 2 million viewers the prior week to 1.7 million viewers. That's per week, right? According to Nielsen Media Research, the show dropped even steeper to 23 in the key news demographic. It's 23rd in all these news shows. And this is, you know, the primetime show from 214... Uh, 214,000 viewers for the full week before to 164,000 viewers. So she gets almost nobody watching. And the people watching are the worst. You know, people watching MSNBC and CNN and believing it to be true. They're like the lowest consciousness people. Many of them are older. And so she's a younger person that can't get any viewers, right? And, you know, the amount of people who watch truther videos and believe in truth or theories is, you know, hundreds of million, probably over 100 million people, you know, subscribe to some of these views and beliefs. So she's out there saying it like she's the authority, right? Right, when she says this stuff, it's like she's the authority, but it isn't, they're not successful, MSNBC and CNN, right? Not nearly as successful as the truth or, you know, information or alternative media that's available on social media run by the Epic Times chief financial officer. Since 2020, the CFO has allegedly been buying millions of dollars of prepaid debit cards at 70 to 80 cents per dollar from criminals on cryptocurrency exchanges. I mean, nice work if you can get it. The Epic, Epic Times CFO is being charged with bank fraud and conspiracy to commit money laundering and could face up to 30 years in prison. All of this is negative press for the Epic Times and positive news for the health of our... Yeah, but people who watch these shows, and I'm not saying you should believe in Epic Times or in um, Alex Jones because they're, you know, whatever they are, shills and, you know, whatever disinfo, disinfo they're putting out. But the people who watch that are just going to say this is a setup because the same way they're feeling about Trump because you guys are not believable and you're underhanded and you're misusing the criminal justice department. And we all know it, right? Not that Trump is Trump sucks, but you know, that's the way it appears because you guys suck. Information ecosystem. And to that end, to the to the triumph of reality uh, over conspiracy, there was also news reality on over conspiracy on this front. Let me begin by asking a very simple question. Do we know the truth about what really happened in the 2020 election? That was far-right activist Dinesh D'Souza's conspiracy theory-filled documentary, 2,000 Mules. When that film debuted, Trump hosted a screening of it at Mar-a-Lago, and Rudy Giuliani and Mike Lindell, the pillow guy, they were all there in attendance. They're all there, Mike, Mike Lindell. It is a very schlocky film that alleges thousands schlocky. of people were paid to dump Biden ballots in drop boxes across the country and steal the 2020 election. It is a complete fabrication, but the right wing went... Okay, so how, how is it complete fabrication? Because election cheating happens, and I'm not saying it's true. Dinesh D'Souza and the right wing and Trump suck and they're all liars and whatever. But election rigging happens. America fixes elections in other countries. Elections are not sacred, and people cheat. Again, so you're saying that Democrats would never cheat. In fact, there was a, a documentary put out by Amazon called Kill Chain, which was about Democrats complaining because they thought Trump was going to rig the election using faulty, uh, these, um, these uh, you know, the computer uh, software hacking and things like this. And it turned out to be uh, mail-in ballots that were questioned. But they believed that Trump was going to rig the election. And Hillary Clinton talks about the Russians rigging the election. But now that's just, you know, that's something Americans would ever do. Right? What are you talking about, right? bananas for it. To this day, the film 2000 Mules is a central part of the MAGA revisionist history of 2020. And last week, after a lawsuit was filed against the media company that distributed that film, Salem Media Group, they stopped distribution and they issued a formal public apology. 
So a pretty good week for reality and a pretty bad week for conspiracy. <laughs> for reality. You're the arbiters of reality. And that doesn't just matter for the health of our public discourse. It also matters for the health of our democracy. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, Alex Wagner, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, I guess a little bit more here. Because it wasn't just 2,000 mules that was pushing the big lie. All of these outlets were. The big lie. You know, the big lie. Let me show you. Let, let's go to my the big lie um, um, stuff that I have here. Is a lie. But this lie, his big lie. The big lie. His own big lie. The big lie. I, I, I doubt any of them are stupid enough to believe the big lie. Of the big lie. And by the big lie. Deranged by the big lie. Continue to perpetuate the big lie. That big lie and the big lie. It's because... The big lie. The big lie is the big lie. is uh, The big lie. This whole big lie election. There is a new big lie making the round. And big lies, a big lie. These big liars is the big lie. The big lie is just that a big lie. President Trump told a big lie. One of the biggest ever told. This big lie is perpetrate an act upon the big lie that, that Donald Trump perpetrated the big lie. The face of provable lies. Lies that right now are continuing. Big lie. Trump's lies. Conspiracy theorists would rather travel across the country in service of the big lie. Extraordinarily dangerous to spread the big lie. Pose the big lie. Standing against the big lie. Yeah, I said it. We know that the big lie was cooked up. You got the, the big lie. About the, the function of the big lie. Had been banned from sites like Facebook and Twitter, but his interviews with right-wing media where he continues to repeat the big lie. They're part of the big lie. Goebbels and the great lie. You keep repeating the lie, repeating the lie. Big lie. People will know it's one thing for one man, one woman, to repeat the lie over and over and over again. So that last part of the compilation, this is the voiceover that I was going to do before any of this stuff happened. I woke up to the Alex Jones thing, right? <laughs> Um, you know, uh, I got recommended a video on YouTube. But where Biden's saying they repeat the lie over and over again comes from my book, The Choice. I mean, you know, he didn't read my book, The Choice, but I talk about how they have to repeat the lies over and over again because the truth wants to come out, right? Everything in the universe wants to be purified and brought back to its divine nature its original, pure, purest, unadulterated state, right? It's pristine condition. And a lie is not that, right? A lie is something that is not divine in origin. It's created by human beings' imagination and their ability to twist reality. And so the only way they can keep the lie going is to keep on saying it over and over again. And they use things like talking points. And not that Trump... You know, the whole thing isn't, you know, it isn't like Trump won the election and Biden cheated. It's like the whole thing is a lie, right? Trump's whole thing was a lie. His election, his presidency, it's all, you know, Trump's a, a huge liar himself, right? But the big lie is a joke. And the thing with Alex Jones, you know, this video went a lot longer, the beginning part. I went and found his original video on his Infowars, and he's claiming that on that video, it was last Saturday. Today's Saturday, June 8th. It was Saturday, June 1st. And he's still putting up content, right? But he's claiming they were coming in to lock the doors. And I got a bunch of stuff. I'm going to cover that at the beginning, or it'll be a, a whole video will be about that next, you know, my next video. I'm not going to do that there, but it's kind of hilarious. Classic Alex Jones. But let me get to what I was going to say, you know, all along here. You know, this was the beginning. It was supposed to be the whole video here. But it ended up going in a different direction. You know, I um, when I first was inspired, you know, I had sort of a visionary type of, um, you know, I had this, I've always had like a visionary personality, but, you know, my first thought I had something to say in terms of writing books and eventually this YouTube channel. You know, I had this thing where I had this spiritual experience that I believe was a Shruti, where you download a, something from, the divine process. I described this in a recent video with Shruti counseling that became Pockets of the Future and then all these other things. But it's where, you know, I can look at something like um, 
whatever's being said here about Alex Jones or any subjects that I cover, and I just see it, or this information just comes to me. It was like a switch was thrown, and I was, you know, inspired to be able to create this kind of content or any content, right? And, you know, when that happened, I was working at a job as a counselor with sex offenders, a clinician with sex offenders. And the place was unbelievably corrupt and abusive in itself. And then I'd come home to an apartment, a cockroach-filled apartment, with six kids, four kids were mine, two from my ex's previous marriage, and my ex who, you know, who was, I mean, when she would have meltdowns, she would cut herself, or like when we'd have arguments, I'd have to go hide the knives, and, you know, so it was like chaotic, crazy, you know, time in my life, and this crazy, you know, relationship with this person who was unstable and would use suicide as a way to, you know, self-abuse and suicide as well to control situations, and that's just like to get an understanding of what it was like. But it was, you know, there are so many intricate aspects of it. And so I had this inspiration. I had this sort of vision of, you know, what I do now here. But I couldn't do it. Like, I didn't have the energy and time to do any of it. Like, I had a book to write and, you know, I had these uh, videos I could make and just all this information that was flowing through me. And I wasn't clear about how to go about it because every day, and this is like for most of you, you know, this was an extreme circumstance given my relationship with my ex and who kind of, the kind of person she was and this extreme job I was working. But most people have this. You might have this in your life where you work a job that sucks you dry. It just completely drains you of your energy. And all your energy goes into coping with that job. And then the support system that you're supposedly supposed to have also drains you. You know, going back to this thing with Celine Dion, where you don't even have time with your kids where you can have catches and, you know, positive interactions with your kids because you get home from your job and you're just dealing with all this drama in your job and then in your life that you don't have any time to go and be who you're supposed to be. Like whatever vision you had of your, you know, whatever type of person and potential you have, whatever you could do, like something special or something different or you know something that was just the least satisfying to you in a way that was congruent with who you are as a person instead you're selling your time and your energy to the beast right and then you know the other aspects of your life are also stressful and you have to put energy into your you know your family your kids your your spouse even if they're good people like they drain you as well and you can never have enough time to figure out a way to do something different you have never enough time to like figure out a different plan like you're caught in this trap and you're just making enough money so you don't have time to like you go on vacation and you just need a couple of weeks to just clear your thoughts and then you might start having some thoughts about ideas and, and you know things that you could do but then you go back to work and you're being drained again and it's the way they steal your time and keep you down by the pressure you're the economic pressure around you and all the other aspects of it and so this is the problem with sheeple. This is a problem with pretty much everybody, that they don't have the wherewithal in their lives to be able to see through all the things that hold them down. And on top of that, you have a lot of people who, you know, they live in the same area their whole life. And they take pride in their state and their town and their family and their community. And they root for the same teams. Like, you know, many of them, like, they'll, They'll root for the Alabama football team, but many of them didn't even go to college, right? And they don't even have association with Alabama or Florida or any of these, you know, a lot of these Southern schools or whatever it is, right? But people root for their home team, Michigan, you know, Ohio State, and, you know, they, they can't see past any of those things. You know, they go to church and they, you know, they have a community there. And so any of the things that they are, you know, indoctrinated into. And it's a part of who they think of themselves as an identity, that they're part of this group. They're part of this family. They're part of this community they live in. They're part of the state. And they, you know, they never think about moving from where they are. They never think about rooting for a team that isn't 
you know, a local team. They'll ne never think about exploring something beyond the indoctrination of their religion, you know, thinking about God on a spiritual level. They can't make that leap. And anything that threatens that, if you suggest that those institutions that, are, that they're tied to, you insult their state and they want to fight you, you know. <laughs> you know, like you say something bad about their state, and they're like, what do you mean it's the greatest, you know, like they, they're so indoctrinated. And their time is being used up and, you know, their energy is being used up in what I referenced earlier in terms of their jobs and their family, that they don't have enough energy to even look at. You know, they have f different levels of patriotism in, in the country. And so they don't have any, uh, you know, any of this, anything within them to um, confront the lies because they can't even deal with it, right? They can barely get through a day every day and they're exhausted and they're and they're wiped out and they're just being used like their energy is just being sucked from them and their their time is just disappearing and they get old and it's even worse they don't have their useful energy and they get overweight and they you know they're eating foods that are toxic and poisoning them and they can't you know they're drowning and they're getting stupider as time goes on their your know, body's full with these chemicals and they're you know they're drinking and they're you know self-medicating and and they're just getting worse and, you know, more and more dumbed down and more and more and more idiocracy. And this is happening even, you know, people in the truth community. They can't you know, find a way to get take a breath of air and, you know, think about things in a different way and contemplate it and be philosophical and think about, you know, what they're doing, what their lives are about, right? And if they do wake up, it's a situ situational awakening where they, they're part of a group like the Cubies and they're still this group thinker. They fall into a group with the flat earthers or any of these things that they do, right? You know, the woke, you know, all these people who confront the official story of the government, but they have to do it in the confines of group think and, you know, some security that there's other people like them all believing the same things. And they develop these rules and these things that are pillars in their intellectual makeup, like this happened in the truth community, like thermite was used. And when I made a video showing that Thermite was, you know, it's just, it was a lie. There was nothing there. The thermite wasn't used in controlled demolitions. And they, 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 people attacked me. They couldn't, you know, deal with that, right? Because now they've replaced their old indoctrination with truther indoctrination. And Alex Jones was, you know, at the center of that truther indoctrination, the Infowars, even though he was a proven shill, you know, he went south. I mean, he was, there were some positive things to his show back, I don't know, 15 years ago. But he had that interview in 2008 or 9 with Piers Morgan. And from there on, you know, he was he was uh, covered in the mainstream media and he became like just, he went full right wing and then he backed Trump and then backed Trump and now he's backing Trump again. And, you know, people are talking, I'm going to cover this as well, the evangelicals are talking about Trump like he's the second coming of Christ. And he's clearly not a spiritual person. He's a selfish prick and a disaster, right? And so people can't reach up to, you know, the, the reality that the system itself is strangulating them and that it's a bad system and that, you know, there's no way out for all of us because we're dependent on the system that is holding us down. It's abusing us and keeping us, you know, disconnected from who we are as people and our souls and the divinity within us and things like this. It's very hard to get to that place. And that's where I am in terms of my content. So the potential viewership has shrunk, right? You know, there's a comment that just came in. I think I took a photo of it. Let me see if it's here. Um, the person writes here, time to get a real job like the rest of us. There's one response here I wanted to read as well. Um, <laughs> time to get a real job like the rest of us and then person responded yeah don't don't do what makes you happy don't contribute to society don't follow your dreams slave away your life and become miserable see you know let me make this point this comment just came in today i was already going to say this stuff beforehand but for me to do this work and it is work i need to be compensated because doing this as a hobby is not really i mean you can't be good at it right because you know, unless maybe you were single and you had a part-time job or your job that wasn't all that draining, it takes time and energy to put into these videos 
and just the thought process and just talking like I talk two hours a day on the mic or whatever and it's you know it's draining like it drains your energy there's energy flowing through you and you know, you think it isn't that draining but it is right like talking and doing this is you know all the stuff that I do here it, it takes your energy away right it's just like anything else it's work and you need to have energy and you need to have you know uh, like if I'm stressed out and I'm dealing with a bunch of things my videos suffer and I have to separate myself from all that stress or whatever but you know the time and energy goes and there's days like you know by the end of the day I can't produce this content the creative you know content it takes the creative force and it's draining like you know it's I have to work outside also being on the computer and things like this to compensate and to sort of you know I mean do the spiritual meditation I do the cleaning I do and all these things to produce this content and you know being able to just sit back and think about things and you know just have some inspiration it's hard to do that when you're in the rat race and the grind and that's where most people are and that's why even when people wake up they don't really fully wake up because they only can wake up on, on the amount of overwhelm you can take and the overwhelm gets worse and worse as you realize more and more about the truth because the overwhelm is overwhelm isn't as bad when you think Alex Jones isn't a shill or you think that Tucker Carlson is legitimate or you think that Trump could actually you know make America great again it's not as bad then but when you realize that they're all part of it right and the whole thing is in you know part of it whether they know they're part of it or not right we're all part of it in, in ways that we're not willing to see or admit so it's all of those things and when you're wrapped in the in you when you're you know when you're in the trap when you're in the rat race and you're just you know spinning the wheel of your life away because most of the things that you do have no value to your you know who you are as a person you're selling your time and energy for food doing a job that is more or less meaningless oftentimes the job is contributing to the you know the beastly system in some negative way you know that contributing to propping up the system but it's not better for you it's not helping you right and being able to break free from that and just take a breath and think about things and you know I remember feeling like if I could just have some time where I could you know could just sit back and and focus on this instead of having to to deal with all the stuff in my life the drama and the drama and the you know all of it I remember feeling it like I, if I could just you know break free for a little bit and you know be able to do that and you know after my ex and I split up my videos got so much better and you know I had all this energy that I was going into my that relationship I'm covering this you know this is going to be part of my journey series as well and so you know all those things are imperative to um you know being able to understand the nature of what's going on right you know I was telling this story in my journey series about my ex you know when I figured out that I was dyslexic I didn't figure it out I you know my ex was homeschooling my kids and she could see that they were struggling with um their you know whatever it was their um their uh like you know their their education and she thought she looks at looked up dyslexia thought that the kids well some of the kids might be dyslexic and it turned out that the stuff it said about dyslexics are things that I had in full and I had been evaluated I went to like Yale University I was a kid for this these different types of tests and you know it came out that like I had a high IQ but I had some issues but non-specific and I called my mom and I said you know I'm dyslexic because I read it and I'm like totally dyslexic right and she said yeah of course you are and I said well, why didn't you say something and she goes oh and she had to have an answer I don't know if she didn't want to hurt my self-esteem but I'm like Jesus mom this would have been helpful if I knew I was dyslexic <laughs> early on in my life right and it was a way my ex had of putting me down like I was lesser than but I looked it up right and there's all these famous people and I talk about this in my journey series I'm going to put this voice over there the journey series 151 um, but dyslexic uh, like here's two things it says about here it says um, uh, why, are, why are so many billionaires dyslexic people with dyslexics often see different things from other people they can help them to this can help them to spot problems other people might miss or come up with creative solutions this is a valuable skill for entrepreneurs 
and these various people like Einstein and all these famous people, you know, some of them are people we don't like in the truth community, but you look up who, you know, who was a famous people and they were dyslexic, right? And, you know, Bill Gates was dyslexic, for example. So these, some of these other people, famous people in history like Winston Churchill. And it says, can dyslexic people have a high IQ? Absolutely, you know, that very, very many people with dyslexia have high IQs. You know, when I see some of the limitations I have because I'm introverted and, you know, my social skills and I'm very highly introverted as well, you know, things that help me spiritually and meditative and help me in the job I'm doing here also, you know, are difficult in my life, right? But, you know, this idea and there's all these things that were said here that it's said here, um, you know, because there's this idea of uh, neurotypical and neuroatypical. But when they talk about dyslexia and, you know, some of these other things, there's autistic people are very, you know, um, successful as well. They call it a disability, right? But it's just that you're configured differently and you, you know, you have a different way of understanding or perceiving the world as well as in terms of your educational style and the way that you learn. And it doesn't go along with the other things that people are doing, right? And so many of us suffer dyslexics and introverts and people like that suffer even though we have something to offer but the system itself is not configured to deal with us or educate us or any of these things right it doesn't want us it doesn't want people who are some of us are configured to be truthers right it's easier for us like because of what i said like i never rooted for the whole team i never identified with connecticut and had some connection i didn't de identify with my community you know i was a religious person and i had some connection with Jesus and his teachings and things when I grew up. But I, you know, I was also somebody who could see through the religious aspects of the, the stuff that wasn't so great in the religion itself. And I could see that there was something better, which was spirituality, which is where you have direct connection with the divine. And so these things were already in me and it made it easier for me to do what I had to do. And so like, I don't, you know, begrudge people who are connected to their communities and to their churches and to their families and things and to the, you know, to all of it, the government, because I understand how hard it is for people to break free. Like I was lucky, you know, I look at the dyslexia and the way I was configured in, internally as a gift for, you know, especially since I was supposed to do this work, right? But I understand that's why when people talk about sheeple, you know, I used to think that way about sheeple, but I realized that you know, it, all of us who are able to make the leap and make the full leap, right? Not a partial leap into being a QB and still being a right-wing person, but also considering yourself a truther when you're really not because you haven't, you're only seeing half of the issue. It's easy to see half. <laughs> you know, it's a lot easier to see half than, than deal with all of it, right? You know, but that's where we are as, a, as a human beings that, you know, you have to break three, free from the system. You have to somehow you know, clear some time and energy for yourself to to see through all the stuff and see the truth, right? And it allows you to, you know, penetrate to deeper levels and understanding. And it's a journey. Like, you, you're, you know, you, if people are saying the same things they said 10 years ago, then they're not you're growing. You, you, it's not like you're, you know, yeah, the first step is you see that the official story is a lie. But then there's a long journey to find the truth and most people don't even, you know, make it past the first wrong. They get caught up in, you know, bullshit new narratives that people are putting out there for self-aggrandizement. You know, these flim-flam men like Trump and Alex Jones who, you know, see that people are freaked out when they realize their their system is not what they were told when they went to school and what they grew up with. And then they come up with a these counter BS narratives and they push them on the, the people and the people run to them because they want something solid to hang on to and then they you know they get indoctrinated to these you know these truth or things that are just bs right instead of being on a journey of truth which is you know you're constantly evolving in your understanding and becoming more sophisticated more refined and you're willing to perceive what's going on and then you know you're being honest about it you're learning to be honest with yourself and and be uncomfortable with all these things right and, you know, it takes a long time to get to a place like that, especially like when everything in society is trying to make you conform and pull you back in, right? 
and make you just like everybody else and just, you know, dumb you down and just, you know, put your, your nose to the grindstone and just, you know, crank out some, you know, unimportant, un- uninspired work and just, you know, take some self-medications and whatever it is or prescription drugs to, to numb the pain, right? And so this is, you know, the pain of the truthers. This is what it is to be a truther, right? You're going to, you know, you have to deal with the pain and, and things that other people don't want to deal with and don't have the ability to because they're so asked out, you know, they're so overwhelmed by life, they're so bankrupt energetically, internally, that they can't even, you know, contemplate something like this being true. You know, their, you know, their situation being way worse than they ever thought. Like, their situation sucks right now, individually, but they have no idea what the forces are that govern their, you know, their world and their, and their, you know, their, their existence. And it's way worse than anybody thought. And like they're, you know, you're dependent on a system and, a, you know, these people that are taking you in like a demonic direction, right? <laughs> like taking you away from your soul, taking away from, and I mean your religion and all these, you know, flim flam man and all of them. They're all, you know, doing you wrong. And you're doing yourself wrong, right? Because you're, you know, you, deep down you're not trying to working towards finding the truth. Like you, you want something to be, you know, make you feel better and soothe your, you know, your pain and your, you know, whatever it is, right? And so everyone's a part of this because deep down they don't really, the truth is there for them to see and they don't want, they don't want it or they can't even conceive of the truth, right? They just don't have the energy to be able to do it. It's overwhelming. You know, I've talked about the Mahabharata. You know, there's the characters of Krishna and his, you know, best friend Arjuna. And in, on a soul level, there they represent Vishnu's soul. Like Vishnu is the the divine functionary, the god of preservation, right? You know, I believe all these things to be there's some truth in them. And Vishnu uh, is the the soul part of, uh, you know, uh, Krishna is the soul part of Vishnu, and and Arjuna is the um, the human side, the ego. But they're, you know, they often are incarnate together and they're like, you know, twin souls. One's the divine, one's the, you know, the human part. And so they're about to fight the Mahabharata and Arjuna's got to kill like all of his relatives and his teacher. All these like people are, are on the bad side because of duty and one way or another, they're on the wrong side. And Arjuna's got to kill all of them because he's like the only like good archer in his family. He's like, you know, this... um. You know, he's the you know he's the one that's got to kill all these people, and he throws down his bow and arrow. He says he can't do it, and Krishna goes, "Well, like you're going to destroy the universe if you don't do what you're supposed to do." And Krishna shows him his spiritual side, like he shows him all of it. You know, this is the Oppenheimer quote. You know, from the you see that Oppenheimer, he looks like a little demon. And he talks about this interaction between Krishna and Vishnu when they made the atomic bomb. They were thinking that they were feeling the same way. Oppenheimer said they were feeling the same way as Krishna was with Arjuna and it's not really, he doesn't, he butchers the story, he doesn't really get it but Arjuna is looking at his soul right, he's looking at what his soul is and when he sees it he goes okay, don't ever fucking show me that again I'll do whatever you want, just don't show me that again, right like, <laughs> like he would rather go kill his relatives than see his true soul nature like that's his ego going oh my god that's you know that's what it is don't ever show me that again i don't care you i'll do whatever you want i just don't want to see that again right and that's the problem like human beings you know they're scared of the demon with inside them right they're scared of the darkness inside them but they're even more scared of the soul they're more scared of their potential which is why human beings don't rise up spiritually they're scared of their true potential than they are of their you know their demonic potential and they're scared of both, but they're scared of the the higher more than the lower. And that's why human beings have, you know, unless there's some big time changes, like this isn't going to go, it's going to, it's got to end badly, right? Human beings' refusal to, um, to embrace their divine nature is what is, you know, bringing humanity down right now. And we'll see if that changes. And I don't know, and I've seen it, and I've talked about it, the whole heartfulness debacle. I've seen saintly people. And, you know, we all struggle. People with, 
you know, saintly tendencies, people with spiritual tendencies, we all struggle with it. We all struggle with embracing our divine nature. And people get to a high level, even like someone like Jesus, you know, he had his momentary lapses and fall, falls at the end of his life, you know, Father, why hath thou forsaken me, was a fall, right? That was his lack of faith in these things. I mean, it happens to everybody. And, you know, it's something you have to work your way through, and it's not easy to do that. And, you know, I don't know if people collectively or even a few of us will be able to do it, right? Never mind everybody. But that's our predicament. But most people don't even get onto the playing field because they're too asked out and bankrupt from their lives, like I said earlier. And that's the sad part. So, you know, these things all have to change because we're all going in the wrong direction. And there's no fixing the system because it's built on going in the wrong direction. It's built on demonic energy, debt, and, you know, illusion, and, you know, all these things. And the disconnection from God and who you are as a human being and warping you into something that you're not, right? Most people have been transformed into something that's not at all uh, consistent or congruent with who they are as a soul. And that's what our system does to us. Anyways, you know, I'll continue on the next video, I don't know, a couple... Uh, a couple of days or something. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano, definitely pointing for the apocalypse and the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.